signing up to um, give a Brumbach talk, and my dream was um, that came true, so here he is, I'm so delighted. Um, I'm also glad to welcome to the podium somebody who, said, who shares uh, training in England uh, with me. He, he graduated uh, from, the, from Warwick uh, University of Cape and Cambridge, and also um, the to work at Quarter yes. of, of, of Art, so, which, which indicates he has been trained uh, in, in some of the best institutions in, in England. Um, so I'm delighted that we have him here. But uh, thankfully for us, he, he emigrated to the uh, to United States, and, so, and he has been teaching at prestigious universities, including Northwestern University where he taught uh, conflict and art history. Um, that's before coming to Detroit, where he is currently professor in critical theory and literature in the Department of Liberal Arts at the College of Creative Studies. He has published widely, and uh, he spared me uh, the list of his <laughs> publications. Uh, I've been reading forever here. But he has published widely in French and English on the history of poetics of the avant-garde and has recently published a, a major book entitled Logics of Separation, Exile and Transcendence in Aesthetic Modernity and he published that with Peter Lang, which is one of the, one of the more distinguished publishers. Uh, he's currently uh, completing studies on Guy de Debord and uh, the French Baroque as well as working on a book on Detroit and the ethics of caring for the city. Um, in Detroit, he, he is also recognized. Come on in. Might need to have some more chairs for you. Yes. Um, and he was a member, an original member of the Press Free Advisory Committee on the Arts in Detroit. Um, and just to give you a heads up, uh, if you want to hear more of him, uh, he's going to have a launch of his book, Logics of Separation, on November 9th at the Hillbury Gallery. Uh, and so he's inviting us all, and I'll certainly be there myself. So I am delighted to welcome to the podium uh, to talk about the care of the city, Detroit, with Antigone and Heidegger, Professor. Michael Stone Phillips. Please welcome him with applause. Thank you. I'd like to, to start by thanking Professor Walter Edwards for, for the invitation and also for the hospitality that you showed me. I was a complete stranger to everyone, or just about everyone in that room on the conference at Bildung. And uh, I stayed there all day 
and when he invited me to join them for dinner afterwards, a part of, I, I was of course thankful and very grateful and had a wonderful time, but a part of me did feel that, well, you know, having stayed all day is the least you could do, uh, is give me something to eat. It was a wonderful occasion, and I made a number of new friends, and I'm very happy to be back here. And I'm happy that a number of my students from CCS, colleagues from CCS in the community, and also I noticed quite a few people from St. Paul's Episcopal Church who, who work at Wayne State who are also here. Um, there are going to be some theological issues touched upon, um, though I warn you that it won't be pastoral issues, they will be questions uh, of a strictly anthropological nature. So I'm delighted, I'm delighted to be here. I asked um, the assistant or the center to photocopy, forgive me, um, the, the, the notes that you see, um, a very famous poem by W.H. Auden. Um, when it was first published, in 1937, it had no title, um, Hearing of Harvest Rotting in the Valleys. Um, and I would like to start with this poem, poem and return to it um, a little bit later in my, in, my present, in my presentation. Hearing of harvest rotting in the valleys, seeing at end of street the barren mountains, round corners coming suddenly on water, Knowing them shipwrecked who were launched for islands, we honor founders of these starving cities whose honor is the image of our sorrow, which cannot see its likeness in their sorrow that brought them desperate to the brink of valleys. Dreaming of evening walks through learned cities, they reined their violent horses on the mountains those fields like ships to castaways on islands, visions of dreams of them who trade for water. They built by rivers, and at night, the water running past windows comforted their sorrow. Each in his little bed conceived of islands, where every day was dancing in the valleys, and all the green trees blossomed on the mountains, where love was innocent, being far cities. But dawn came, and they were still in cities. No marvelous creature rose from the water. There was still gold and silver in the mountains, but hunger was a more immediate sorrow. Although to moping villages in valleys some waving pilgrims were describing islands, the gods they promised visit us from islands, our stalking head up lovely through our cities. Now is the time to leave your wretched valleys and sail with them across the lime green water. Sitting at their white sides, forget your sorrow, the shadow cast across your lives by mountains. So many, doubtful, perished in the mountains, climbing up crags to get a view of islands. So many, fearful, took with them their sorrow, which stayed them when they reached unhappy cities. So many careless died and drowned in water. So many wretched would not leave their valleys. It is our sorrow. Shall it melt? Ah, water would gush, flush green those mountains and those valleys, and we rebuild our cities not dream of islands. <clears throat> the poem, when subsequently republished, slightly modified by Auden, um, would bear the title Beisage Mochalise. And it's, of course, it's a sestina. Let me begin with a Latin tag, which I believe you all know. Speramus in, of course, in church diction. Speramus miliora resurgit sineribus. We hope for better days. It Will Rise Again from the Ashes, by Father Gabriel Richard after the Detroit Fire of 1805. Whatever it is, it will rise again from the ashes. There is or has been a Detroit Renaissance, that is a rebirth, but no one has ever proclaimed a Detroit miracle in the sense that one speaks of an Asian economic miracle or a German economic miracle. Only desire for rebirth, 
And this desire for rebirth and rebirthing, for there is something fragile in the very idea of Detroit, which needs care, which needs sustaining, um, points to the densities and fragilities of my title, Care of the, care of the City. Consider, for example, post-Kachina New Orleans, post-tsunami nuclear Fukushima, post-tsunami Indonesia in, nine, in 2004, or more recently the miners imprisoned underground in Chile, in Chile. What is it that gives us a sudden and felt rapport, a sudden and deeply felt sense of empathy? I should like to say it makes no sense whatsoever to use the category of love, but instead to use the category of care. How is it possible, we might ask, that we can care for those whom we do not know? But it is to do with care, not with love, for it is as though disaster beyond measure, disaster beyond measure represented by natural catastrophes, which in another context maybe we could call the call upon the diction of the sublime, disaster beyond measure, in violently collapsing the terms of familiarity, compels a sense, that is a stimmung, a mood in Heidegger's language, of fundamental connectedness and relatedness. The volunteers who have never set foot in New Orleans before Katrina cannot be said to have loved Katrina, but they go there out of a care for their place, a care for people, indeed out of a sense of solidarity, which is one of the fundamental connotations of care. On the other hand, in colloquial English, it is easy to love what is glamorous. One loves the Big Apple, that is New York, so good they had to name it twice, New York, New York. One loves Paris, the city of lights. One loves Rome, the eternal city or my own elder daughter recently returned from Vienna and Venice saying, Papa, why do people go on and on about London? It's so boring after Venice. The standard etymology of the English word care from a current philologist such as Anatoly Lieberman, going all the way back to Skeets in 1882, points to care etymologically as meaning anxiety, sorrow, heedfulness, attention, even verbally, to lament or to sorrow. So the English care has built into its latencies and historical segmentation the idea of grieving, of sorrowing for that for which one cares. The frailty of the body of the loved one, the body about to depart this world, the body capture, incapacitated and thus utterly dependent upon the caring relation, that is the relation of attentiveness heedfulness, underwrit by a certain anxiety or anguish. What though is care? And what is care? That it can make sense to speak of care of the city or of caring or of caring for a city. Here I want to outline quickly three different but deeply interrelated conceptions of care. And the theological conception of care, the existential phenomenological conception of care, and a feminist psychological, relational psychological conception of care as we find it in Carol Gilligan. We must start, I would like to propose, with a theology of care. I'm going to give just one example, the work of the Duke theologian Ellen Davis in her book, Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, published about two years ago by, by Cambridge. Because the theology of, the practice of a theology of care is part and parcel of a generation of theologians who are not only retranslating the Hebrew scriptures, but are rethinking the politics of translation, bearing in mind the foundational, the cultural foundational status that the King James translation of the Bible has in the English speaking, the English speaking world. To rethink translation is necessarily uh, a political activity, and there is a politics implicit in that. And in going back to the declarations from the book of the Tanakh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
That language of dominion is the subject of intense scrutiny and re-translation and, re and reconceptualization. So that what we need to do in, on understanding care is to say care is first not dominion. Care is not dominion understood as power, where power, the sanction of power, and everything that is implicit within that sanction, is conferred to man, and I intentionally use that word, man who is made in the image of God. And so through a divine principle of participation, everything, there's a kind of transitivity of power, as it were, that gives the sanction of dominion. Instead, says Ellen Davis, representing a significant number of scholars, the basic meaning of the Hebrew verb here, rdh, horot, is not to rule. The word denotes the traveling around of the shepherd with his flock. In other words, that this points to not mastery, not power, but a sense of responsibility to that which is created and a continuity with, with that which is created. Second, Heidegger, in Being and Time in 1927, says that one of the fundamental, and this I think is, is philosophical anthropology, um, his concept of care, he says that one of the fundamental um, characteristics of human beings is care. But by care, Heidegger does not mean first and foremost uh, as it were, the way in which I may care for the body of a loved one. He means rather that a dynamic aspect of being in the world is that we are alongside things in the world, that we find ourselves, as it were, one with that which we are a part of. This key concept, the key idea here, is that in finding ourselves already in the world, we find ourselves always in relation to that which is in the world. And therefore, all acts of consciousness not only take us beyond the subject, what we are, it takes us into things with relationship. That is fundamentally what Heidegger means by care, not, as it were, the psychological sense of care. The psychological sense of care is to be found in the great feminist psychologist, um, Carol Gilligan, Whose, um, whose great book, In a Different Voice, was published in 1982, that essays an ethic of care, a gendered notion of care, based upon caregiving, but also one which is situational, based upon narrative and relation rather than separation. Like Heidegger, care is something that puts us already in the world, and so it is relation, not separation, that matters. In other words, it is not the psychoanalytic concept. It is not a psychoanalytic anthropology of separation. Everything in psychoanalysis, and the book that um, Walter was so kind to mention that I've just published, called Logics of Separation, is fundamentally an investigation of a psychoanalytic anthro anthropology. And Heidegger here is like Carol Gilligan, that it is not a psychoanalytic anthropology because it is not separation, but relation and relationality as a function of being in the world that matters. But there what you can see in all cases is that we're dealing with the body, particular bodies, but also anthropologically, we're dealing with a phenomenon of we're dealing with a phenomenon of embodiment. It is these three interrelated senses of care that I am putting into play in this talk. To be sure, the old ontological analogies between body and city are operant here. Think of the poetic avant-garde going back to the tradition of Baudelaire against Haussmannization. La forme d'une ville change plus vite, hélas, d'un cœur. The form of a city changes more quickly, alas, than that of an, a heart. Breton and the Surrealists, equally against all aspects of architectural modernism, against Le Corbusier and modern architecture, Breton famously says, of one of those buildings that look like a factory, that's how he thinks of modern architecture, of one of those buildings that look like a factory, one is certain that nothing can happen in there except boredom. And Guy Debord, in the same poetic tradition of Baudelaire, Breton, will say somewhat more in a more clipped manner of Le Corbusier, he's just a cop, right? <laughs> Certainly, this poetic avant-garde kept alive and, op and operant the analogy at heart organic between the body and city. 
Detroit is not a miracle city like the German or Asian miracles that I mentioned earlier. And this is very important for it points, for it points to a, temporal, a distinctive temporality. The temporality of the miracle city, the miracle economic city, or country, or economic system, is fast, sudden, beyond quickness. Almost, one might, might say, a hysterical temporality. And as such, one in which everyone is for oneself, for him or herself. Whilst the temporality of Detroit, in need of attention, mindfulness, fragile in its becoming, and as such, subject to sudden, unforeseen reversals, in need, that is, of care. This temporality of the city of Detroit is not the hysteric temporality, but the, temp but the temporality of depression. Detroit did have a moment, indeed, an event characterized by, historical, by hysterical temporality, namely the riots of 1967. And the Nachleben, that is the afterlife of which, is still the same event, and which has put us now in a temporality of depression. Here, the attention and attentiveness of the President of the United States in his many visits to Detroit and the sorted dignitaries, the many, many foundations who have taken Detroit as the focus of their attention. Are they, these foundations, I wonder, the new church for a secular age? The artists from outside Detroit joining with the artists already here in the exploration of a new kind and mode of representation the new institutions such as MOCAD that, that with these artists are seeking a new kind of activity and a new kind of form. The whole discourse of symptomatic attention in the anthropology of the visual field called ruin porn, as trite an expression as could be imagined, but a perfect illustration of the Freudian defense mechanism known as reaction formation. Oh yes, and politicians finally aware that they are stuck in an outmoded and irrelevant vocabulary, which is quite an accomplishment for politicians. There can be no doubt that Detroit is the subject of care and caring attention, but as yet there is no critical vocabulary or critical theory for the emerging practices of care in Detroit. Dinner theaters, the powerhouse project, Detroit soup, the type of work of a Scott Hawking or Corinne Vermeulen, the older work of the Heidelberg Project, creative placement, broadly speaking, and, act and social activism, broadly speaking, an ecological or environmental aesthetic practice of care, an ethical aesthetic practice beyond the older term, relational aesthetics. Nor is there a new way of understanding the role, I should like to insist, the creative role, but for some, the troubling role of the foundations. Something scarcely broached is the resentment created in certain quarters by the wealth and power of the, foundation, of the foundations. But since the politically accountable institutions of Detroit are economically and morally and politically bankrupt, our current ways of thinking do not allow for people to be told how to spend their wealth, especially when they are giving it away. Between the League of Revolutionary Black Workers that, whose history is recorded in Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, but you can also see an extraordinary film that they made um, called Finally Got the News, which is online, between the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and Kyung Park's <coughs> superb collaborative venture published as Urban Ecology, Detroit and Beyond. There is a Marxist and Marxist-inflected critical theory which sees the problem as simply the working of capitalism, by which the emptying out of Detroit through depopulation, deproletarianization, etc., are but steps in the taming and training of a new kind of abasant workforce in a landscape made, made for capital bargain hunters. The anthropology underlying this argument, even if carried out with wit and irony in Park's video, Detroit making it good for you, is outmoded and unconvincing. What then would be a more powerful anthropology? It would, I suggest, be broadly, one, biopolitical in thought. That is, social and political, but also unconscious forces do shape bodies and train them for unacknowledged needs. That is to say, created needs. But the whole question of 
how whether a need is authentic or not is itself a deeply problematic one. This is something that would too be based upon a conception of care. That is the sense in which Relatedness is fundamental, something revealed in the violence of collapsing familiarity, as I put it earlier in my talk. A theology of care, an existential phenomenology of care, and a feminist relational psychology of care. Above all three, it would be self-aware, this anthropology, would be self-aware and self-implicated in the inescapability of engagement with power. The poet of this awareness is W.H. Auden in the Sestina that I've just read, and this philosopher, the late Gillian, Gillian Rose, when she argues in her last book, Mourning Becomes the Law, Philosophy and Representation, that no one, and I quote, no one and no community is exempt from the paradoxes of empowerment. No one is exempt from the paradoxes of empowerment. This intrication in power, as a, condition of our, as a condition of our finitude, we can, cannot avoid the negativity of desire, the negativity at work in desire. In other words, there is not available for us the perspective, subspecie eternitatis, of Rilke's angel, who anyway, the angel in Rilke's fifth elegy, who anyway envies us mortals. Let me quote from the closing of the fifth elegy. Angel. And here, um, the fifth elegy is partly inspired by a painting by Pablo Picasso, the Sultan Bank, the clowns, roughly speaking, the clowns, um, who are traveling between circuses. This painting is in the National Gallery in Washington. Washington. Suppose there's a place we know nothing about, and there, on some indescribable carpet, love has shown all that here they're forever unable to manage their daring lofty figures of heart flight, their towers of pleasure, their ladders, long since where ground never was, just quiveringly, quiveringly propped by each other, were able to manage it there before the ringed onlookers there, countless unmurmuring dead. Would not those then fling their last, their forever reserved, ever concealed, unknown to us, ever valid coins of happiness, down before the at last truthfully smiling pair on the quietened carpet. This, move, this, movement, um, this movement of time and infinitude cannot avoid the negativity of desire, the negativity at work in desire, whereby in wanting, and this is the key thesis that I am trying to explore with its negative connotations, whereby in wanting and intending the good, we realize at the same time, and because of our actions, the collapse of the good. The response to Kyung Park is not, here are the rational arguments for the good. Here is how we demystify the obscurantism of capitalism. First, what we are dealing with can scarcely be called capitalism in any classical understanding of this term. Further, what if the system of representation available to us requires not our bon volonté, goodwill, but our energies. And the agency operant, and what if the agency operant in this system of representation is beyond individual ideas of right or wrong? What if throughout the agency of this system of representation there is a profound need for waste, for failure, and indeed for, sacrifici for sacrificial victims? This is where that whole debate, and I would be very happy to come back with slides and give another talk about ruin porn, so-called. This is where that whole debate around so-called ruin porn is trite and trivial, and I must speak plainly on this. For more to the point, and I believe this is something that Jerry Heron in some of his early work has grasped, is that as representations, the ruins point to entropy and entropic states of interruption into the weaving and fabric of the city. Consider that if aesthetic experience is a form of suspension, then here in Detroit, are physical analogs with economic, cultural, and political connotations within the regime of representation, analogs to such suspended states. Consider, too, that at the very moment when New York and its art world were discovering the unform or formless, that is, 
a representation of entropy, and relatedly abjection, here in Detroit was the unfold in plain sight. So whilst one community of advanced art is pursuing the art form and the collapse of energy, and another here in Detroit is desperately seeking escape or recovery from the social and economic art form. Entropy is the term here, and that great American artist, thinker, Robert Smithson knew it. And so, by the way, did the Surrealists, and before them the great symbolist Paul Valéry. Indeed, Breton speaks of ruins that appear only at a certain moment that signifies the collapse of certain traditions of meaning. He said they only appear at that moment of the collapse of those meanings, and that when they do appear, there is inevitably a ghost, le fantôme inévitable qui les hante, marque avec une intensité particulière, l'appréhension du retour des puissances du passé. The, the inevitable ghost which haunts these ruins, appears with a distinctive, that's my translation for particulier, a distinctive intensity, the that is to say the apprehension of the return of potencies of the past. We might ask who or what are the ghosts of Detroit's past? What of its many plural parts, and I should like to insist on that plurality of the past, that are barely contained in this ruination to use a very, very important social term um, of English Regency and Victorian culture. Anyone who has seen, read a Jane, Jane Austen novel knows that the greatest fear is the ruination that comes from a bad marriage, um, and we might say also from, a bad in, from bad investment. From Breton to, um, Breton speaks of the question of ruins, and of ghosts. And from Breton to, um, to Jacques Derrida, I would like to suggest in his analysis of phantoms and phantomation is a very small step. What if Detroit, the idea of Detroit to allude, allude to a poem by the Detroiter Jim Gustafsson, what if Detroit, the idea of Detroit, um, the idea of Detroit, according to whom or what remains hope open? Hence the question of the plural ghosts of Detroit's past that was construct what if the idea of Detroit that was constructed in the 20th century, the era, the era of Fordism and Taylorization, was not something that simply rose from the ashes, as that famous Detroit's um, say motto goes. What if it was not something that simply rose from the ashes, but that was built instead upon the social death of its occupants? It is such issues missing from the very fine work of scholars like Thomas Sigrus, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, which Vince Carducci, when I got the offer to come here in 2005, 2006, Vince is one of the first books that Vince Carducci suggested that I read, and I have read it, Vince. Excellent. The Origins of the Urban Crisis, or in Sidney Fine's um, chapter, uh, Sidney Fine's chapter on, called The Meaning of Violence, in, his, in the 1967 riots from his valuable history, Violence in the Model City. It is hopelessly at sea in reflecting on the trigger for spontaneous collective violence and the nature of that kind of, spontane of spontaneous collective violence. Here is where the interpretation of Antigone and Heidegger's conception of care becomes operant. Fundamentally for Heidegger, care as being alongside others the dimension of being in the Weltsein, of being in the world, points to solidarity. But within a framework of the open and its temporality. Heidegger's temporality, and this is one of the reasons that there is this old question about why is there not an ethics in Heidegger? Because care for Heidegger is linked to the temporality and movement towards the future. And that movement towards the future is necessarily open. And everything that matters for Heidegger hinges on the openness of the movement, Bewegung, towards the future. But his idea of the open is a reversal, explicitly engaged, a reversal of the idea of the open as we find it in the poetry of Rilke, an exact reversal of the relationship of human to the open and of animal to the open. 
For Rilke in the elegies, and particularly the eighth elegy, but it's there in the very first elegy as well, for Rilke in the eighth elegy, the difference between the human and the animal is characterized by the fact that the animal, the animal, the creatur, creaturely creation, the animal is only able to see without time and with a sense of the complete possibility of presentness. When Heidegger begins to read Rilke, he turns it around and says, no, it is the human that has the open a horizon of possibility, and the animal does not because the animal is trapped within the instant. This is what Rilke writes in the Eighth Elegy, and here I'm using Edward Snow's translation. With all its eyes, the animal world beholds the open. Only our eyes are as if inverted and all set around it like traps at its portals to freedom. What's outside we only know from the animal's countenance. Heidegger reverses this, but the boundaries between animal and open, human and the open, excuse me, are uncontrollable in the thinking of futurity, indeed life, and the distinction between life as bios, which in classical Greek philosophy, it's life as bios that it makes us human, not life as zoe, which is just creaturely life, and death. Hence to the form and support of this, namely the city, which is the ultimate support of all of, the, of all of these tensions. Antigone, the play, but also Antigone, the character, cannot be understood, cannot but be understood as a work on the relation between life and death in the form of the city. But a city as vehicle for a drama of care and unconscious desire. A city, that is, which is a function of the projective properties of mind, and thereby necessarily the unconscious. Deleuze did not, as is commonly thought, reject du court the idea of the unconscious. He rejected the Freudian unconscious, to be sure. The unconscious, he said, is more like a factory of regimented behavior. I consider this a characterization of the social and political unconscious productive of social death something in no wise different from the Dantean iconography of London in Eliot's The Buried of the Dead chapter of The Wasteland, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. Antigone's care for her unburied and socially outcast brother, Polynices, begins with her desire to see him ritually buried with the imagination of the work of her hands upon his, upon his body. Will you take up that corpse with me, she asks, is many. <coughs> and this is enacted from the moment this ritual burial is enacted, from the moment that her hands drop the dust over his body, as reported indirectly by the guard to Creon. Creon. And everywhere in this reporting, we hear the registers of care in the etymological registers to, to which I would like to bring attention. <coughs> Sorrow, lament, grieving, a pained form of attending. This is what the guard reports to Crown. We saw the girl. She cried the sharp and chill cry of a bitter bird which sees the nest there when the young birds lay, where the young birds lay. So this same girl, seeing the body stripped, cried with great groanings, cried a dreadful curse upon the people who had done the deed. Soon in her hands she brought the thirsty dust, and holding high a pitcher of wrought bronze, she poured the three libations of the dead. From the, that moment, Polynices is saved from beast, and from mere nature, de creatur, in the language of Rilke, from what that is would make of his being an instance of social death. With the dust dropped literally from her hand and the libations for the dead poured, he, Polynices, will not be left, I quote, unwept, untuned, a rich, sweet sight for the hungry birds beholding, unquote. All of the contemporary discourse called biopolitics 
I think of the work, obviously, of Michel Foucault's late Collège de France lectures, the work of Giorgio Agamben, and the way in which that work and the scholars of that work have gone back to Hannah Herent's The Origins of Totalitarianism, and in particular, that part of Herent that deals with the question of rights. What does it mean to talk of rights when there is a lack of citizenship? What in France, where this literature is very significant, is called the sans papier, without paper, which here, of course, we call the undocumented. All of the contemporary discourse called biopolitics, prepared by the avant-garde from Lautremont's depiction of animality to Rilke's presentation of animality and the open, is latent in Antigone's care and ambivalence toward the non-human, represented by the hungry birds beholding of her brother's body, even as she is depicted by the guard in terms of the sharp and shill cry of a bitter bird. I am seeing here, as it were, the hungry, birds, the, the hungry bird as being a metaphor, even a symbol, for some of the ambivalences in late, the late modern form of capitalism. The, the late set Benarditi, the classicist, commented insight, insightfully that, and I quote, to be incorporated, and he's speaking specifically of Antigone, of which he wrote a very great commentary, to be incorporated into the non-human, the literal bestialization of man, one can say, is the primal terror. The question whether this terror is part of the core out of which man's need for gods arises, or whether the gods haven't given man his humanity, enjoying the law that man live up to their gift underlies all of Antigone. And tellingly, Benaditi adds, Antigone herself seems to point to the truth of either answer. Unquote. The ambivalences and uncontrollable fissures in Antigone's experience of limit, the Greek word for limit here is apte, and to the open, that is the energies between life and death, human and non-human, are very much the issue of the emerging discourse of biopolitical thought within which I'd like to put the larger framework for care. And here Lacan, Jacques Lacan, rejoins the great classicists such as Seth Benaditi, who both understand the enigma of Antigone as rooted in the aporetic relation between desire and the good. Benaditi says um, in his commentary on Antigone and looking at Eros, Eros's power shows itself in his, Eros's being, both the love of one's own and the love that destroys, that destroys one's own. own. For Lacan, Antigone's beauty stems precisely from the overstepping of limits pushed by desire and hence death, and hence death. He says that the latte, that is the limit qui relève de l'autre, du champ de l'autre, n'appartient pas à Créon, c'est par contre le lieu où se situe Antigone. The limit upon, qui relève de l'autre, which is based upon the other, calls upon the other, from the field of the other, does not belong to Créon, and therefore to the public dimension of rulership, to the public dimension of the symbolic, and therefore all that is con connoted by the symbolic. It is par contre, on the other hand, le lieu, the place, où se situe Antigone, where Antigone situates herself. And then going back to this image of suspension, states of suspension, with which I be 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 began, let us look at the, the imagery, the iconography of ruined pause as a state of suspension, entropic states of suspension. Let us look at that as an analog for something which we are meant to be reading, understanding, decrypting, rather than talking about ruined poems. Lacan says, takes this idea of suspension, being beyond limits, that her punishment, sans supplice, va consister, consister à être enfermé, suspendu, dans la zone entre la vie et la mort that her punishment is going to consist in being closed in, suspended in the zone between life and death. 
And everything that applies here in this argument to Antigone applies to cities, which are organic and therefore have a life of their own. Indeed, this temporality of the city is fundamentally a temporality that is projective of the capacities of the body or anthropolo in anthropological language, philosophical anthropological uh, language of embodiment. Let me give you one or two, as I move towards my conclusion, one or two very famous examples in the tradition of symbolism, surrealism, and Jacques Derrida. At the beginning of the famous essay by Paul Valéry, um, La Cru which is in, in um, French is called La Crise de l'Esprit, The Crisis of the Mind, but which interestingly, published in 1919 at the end of the First War, World War, was first published in English as The Crisis of the Mind, one of the most famous openings in contemporary modern French prose. Nous autres civilisations, nous savons maintenant que nous sommes mortels. We later civilizations, we too now know that we are mort that we are mortal. He develops this idea of the mortality of civilizations and by implication the mortality of cities with another very, very famous image that the Surrealists took up, that the Surrealists took up, that Derrida also took up. And it's here of ruins. Standing now, he says, on an immense sort of terrace of Elsinore, that is, of course, Hamlet's castle, right? Standing now on an immense sort of terrace of Elsinore that stretches from Basel to Cologne, bordered by the sands of Neuport, the marshes of the Somme, the limestone of Champagne, the granites of Alsace, that is to say the whole of Europe, our hamlet of Europe is watching millions of ghosts. And I'm trying to suggest that that temporality is the temporality that we need to pay, to which we need to pay attention as part of a renewal of our understanding and critical vocabulary of the city. The great Jane Jacobs, just to take the title of her greatest and most famous work, The Death and Life of Great American, the, uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. And Bichat, the, the, the great histologist, the great, great scientist of the 18th century, for whom many of us probably came to first because of Michel Foucault. Bichat gave, a, a, in French at least, a very famous definition of life. To ce qui résiste à la mort. Life is simply everything that resists death, right? That is life. But why I mention that is because once we get into the scientific, the serious scientific literature, there's absolutely no agreement to this day on what it is that we mean by life. But whatever it is, Bichat's working definition will work for us. To ce qui résiste à la mort. Everything that resists death. At a certain moment, it whatever it is, it ceases. And care, I would then suggest, becomes the mark of faith in the irreversibility of human time. It's done. Thank you. Wow. Walter, I don't know if there's time for questions. Well, it must. Please. Questions, comments? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll congratulate you on the synthesis of, of everything that you brought together, all the different discourses uh, that ended, ended uh, incredibly co cogently uh, and even practically in terms of issues that we have on the table in aesthetics and in terms of negotiating the city. Thank you. And um, I'm, you know, I'm struck by you know, a central concept. In addition to care, maybe even more to the point is social death and what is meant by social death. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I, I move from social death to various forms of reaction formation around social death, like cluelessness mm -hmm. is one of them, and there are various forms of cluelessness that, that were in your paper, and I think they were all in the right place. Um, and then there's also the, the Detroit phenomenon of the fortified silo. Yeah. Uh, that's an entailment of the social death. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, rigid adherence to boundaries and yes. the re retraction of life to zones of viability, mm -hmm. and then the notion that the spaces between those viabilities are intractable. Um, so that uh, watching millions of ghosts might be exactly what one does when one gets outside of the fortified silo. 
but I want to think a little bit about the way of social death differing from death itself, mm -hmm. and ways in which uh, social death is a form of resistance of death too. You know, ways in which it's not exactly the same to say that social death is death. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's something I'm thinking about. The ways that social death actually perpetuates itself as a dynamic, not just is a negative or you know reactive. It's not, it, your, your quote from Foucault, you know, death is what, life is what resists death. Mm -hmm. But I think social death also resists death in a funny, symptomatic, mm -hmm. and not very happy way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where I'd like to, to um, go. First, thank, thank you for your generous comments about it. Um, the concept of social death is one I think that many people at this table um, will know is, is most readily associated with the Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson. Um, very, very important work that he wrote on the history of slavery. Um, and he is, approaches it from a point, an anthropological point of view. That is to say, slavery was, is a universal social institution. There are different kinds of slavery. Um, and then he develops this through, the, through to a particular analysis that, nevertheless, there are different kinds of slavery, and there is a kind of slavery that is akin to a form of social death where all questions of agency, all questions of creati creativity, all questions of autonomy have been taken away. Let me just point out to um, some of the audience here that there are a number, quite a significant number of students from CCS and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply gratified by that. And they are currently surviving a class that I'm teaching called Care of the City, <laughs> where some of these ideas are being explored and this, um, this presentation constitutes, Barrett, you used the right word, a synthesis of materials, as it were. I'm now using a grown-up forum to, to see what does this sound like and how does it work. And precisely the issue is social death is not physiognomic death. We, we agree. But it must in some way be parasitic. Right? It must in some way be like that, which is why I'm using this idea of ghosts, of phantoms, that we know that ghosts do not have life, as we think of it, and yet our whole physiology reacts in fear to the idea of ghosts. We know that ghosts do not have life, and yet we, want, we think of ourselves as capable of having some kind of relationship with them. So I take the idea of social death here as fundamentally a way of trying to rethink what for me is one of the big problems, which is agency. That it is, we, it is, you can, we could say that the generation of Foucault, Derrida have really, really jumped into us, that agency is not within the subject uniquely, right? We can take that for granted, but I am by no means convinced that we have developed a sufficiently sophisticated vocabulary then to say, well, where does this take us with notions of agency? So I take the example of social death as one instance of this where how do we talk about this phenomenon? Eliot um, does this by saying so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. You are, you are barely alive. You are, and yet you have action, but where is the agency? And I'm simply trying to put on the table these issues in order to get to this idea of agency. Everything that you've said about the fortification, I agree with, the silos, these are things in the coming weeks um, that my students are going to be doing presentations on. Um, the control of the city, uh, I would like to explore as well as part of this idea of social death, um, that we are, as it were, one is given enough, enough to, to feel the illusion of existing, but barely existing. Um, you know, that there is, a, there is a, 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 an extraordinary passage in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure when the Duke uh, asks, having, um, is, is, is saying to Angelo, be absolute for death be absolute for death. And he gives this extraordinary speech. Uh, Angelo, of course, does not know that it's the Duke in disguise. Um, and the Duke is say, ends his speech about the preparedness for death by saying, yet what, what's in this that bears the name of life? 
And I would like to suggest that that's the issue. <coughs> What's in this that yet, that yet does bear the name of life? It's the name of life that I would like to get back to in contrast to the, to, to the operant concept of social death. What's yet in this that bears the name of life? That would be just an initial, an initial response. There must be other questions. <laughs> okay. um, Rebecca. Well, I, you reference um, like platonic moral thinking in that <clears throat> virtuousness is uh, partly um, the intention, uh, the good intentions. But when you said like practices and you mentioned cluelessness, mm -hmm. half of the being virtuous is also act, being able to act on it. Sure. So you have to have knowledge and skill. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, what, what, in your opinion, what skills or knowledge m might we be missing to, to really act on our good intentions? Well, Rebecca, partly what I'm suggesting here is that these are not simply questions of individual actions. You and I and everyone in this room are not going to do things, we're just going to do whatever it is we think we need to do in whatever way we, we've become trained to do. That's not the level at which I'm working. I'm working at the level where I want to propose with others that our, des our very desire for the good can have the opposite, okay? And so what would be the condition, what are the conditions in which our desire for the good can have this opposite effect? That even with good intentions we can do harm. Yes, as everyone knows, the way to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And here we have to look at desire. And the social and political unconscious that shapes our understanding of desire. I first explored some of these ideas when I arrived in Detroit, I was very, very fortunate in being invited to join MOCAD's program committee. And the second exhibition at MOCAD in 2007, conjointly with Cranbrook Art Museum, was the two-part exhibition, Shrinking Cities. And I organized a symposium there <coughs> called Waste and Failure, Waste, Symptom, and Failure in the City. I asked myself a question that is a perfectly standard question in critical theory from the 1920s onwards. Given that we have the wealth, technolog the technological means to satisfy basic desires, base no, not desires, basic needs, why is it that we have not? It cannot, the answer to that cannot be a purely rational answer. And we would then need to look at questions of unconscious desire, mm -hmm. And I wanted to explore the question, what if there is at some level unacknowledged at the individual level, obviously, there is some need for waste, some need for failure? What if there is? Most of the panelists didn't want to go there. <laughs> um, Grace Lee Boggs could not, and I perfectly understood, and it was not for me to uh, you know, prod a great woman like this, but she definitely didn't want to go there. She was quite antagonistic, in fact. Frank <laughs> Rashid, um, whom from the first, that was the first time, these were people I invited, and they had nothing better to do than to accept my invitation. And I learned an enormous amount from Frank Rashid. And Frank Rashid, Rashid was looking at this in terms of the social activist who has certain outcomes in mind and cannot afford, therefore, to entertain a discourse about, let's call it an ontology of failure or a political ontology of failure. But I wanted to pose the question, and I still want to pose the question today, given the resources available to us, resources of technology, resources of intelligence, resources of delivery systems, etc., given even the cultural um, representations we make to ourselves about what is the good and what is rational and so on and so forth, why then does it remain the case that there is such absolutely extraordinary, almost pornographic waste in our society? I am still pursuing that question, and so in that light, Rebecca, 
the question of what do we need to be to, to do the good is not the question because that's not the level of the investigation. It is saying we all we can all state those, but the moment that we state that we continue we get onto the path of life, then our unconscious motivations, unconscious desires um, uh, become relevant again, both politically and socially. George, sorry, George, and then Vince. Okay. Uh, so did I hear you also say that? Um, there's like a, a burial or a funeral necessary before we move into the open future? Oh, I am suggesting that, um, and one way of looking at this, I go back, I go, I went back to that um, um, Latin tag motto, um, we hope for better days, it will arise again from the ashes. I'm suggesting that it's by no means obvious that we ever did it arise from the ashes and that what may have been built on that is in fact a form of social death. So that, no, there was not a recovery, but what we need to do is to think the question of desire um, politically and socially to the utmost in order to clarify anthropologically whether in fact there, whether indeed there is some unconscious need for waste. This. First. Just to reiterate what Barrett said, just on a performative level, what an outstanding presentation. Thank it could you. have been the best thing I've heard from you ever. It's really good. Thank you. Um, just as far as this question of waste, I wonder, this is, this is not my real question, but I'll ask it because it keeps floating around. Uh, you know, Bataille and the notion of the general economy, right. the accursed share. Sure. And so, you know, in, in a certain sense, you've made a statement about, uh, you know, representation of capitalism. Uh, certain people would say that the reason that we cannot answer the question you, you uh, ask is because of the requirements of capital. That's mm -hmm. not my question. Right. My question really, had to, just to put that out there, mm -hmm. is we could spend the next couple of days parsing out what's going on. I love parsing. Yeah, I know you do. I love and, we, and, and you're good at it. It's, it's, and I love to parse with you. Let's get together and parse sometime. Um, the question of agency, which you know, uh, in a conventional notion, resides within the subject. What about uh, Bruno Latour's notion of the actant? Bruno Latour's notion of the actant. I have not read that. Then. So ah, interesting. Tell me Actor about network it. theory. Uh, and basically, it comes from the sociology of science. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's the field, but yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, Latour's notion of, of the actant is, in a sense, I think, as I just kind of heard, and I hadn't made this connection until just now, Heideggerian, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, you know, this table is an actant. It yes. provides a variant between you, a barrier mm -hmm. between you and me. Mm -hmm. uh, the city and its existence mm -hmm. well, within space and time is, in a sense, an actant and structures the way in which agency can 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 proceed because there are only you know there are certain things that are possible and some things that aren't. Right. And so I'm just and in in particular you know part of Latour's notion here is to get out of subject-centered agency right. and to deal with with um, attraction mm -hmm. and rejection and these mm -hmm. kind of things in a broader level. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, as you have put it, I completely accept that, and I am working precisely with some such notion. Um, every now and then we all have um, these uh, sort of Moliere moments that we discover that we're talking prose. Yes, this is Heideggerian, um, and it is absolutely, I think, one of the key concepts that underlies the developing ethic of care, biopolitics, and care. It's requiring us to see agency as dispersed. Indeed, one of my first mentors um, was the cybernetician Gordon Pask, um, who developed a very, very distinctive form of cybernetics in which he argued very precisely that there is nothing that does not have in the universe that does not have some degree of agency. The question is, uh, we conceive, conceptualize that that agent, that agency, and I certainly want to suggest that the city. Uh, I believe that this is the case in the avant-garde tradition of Guy Debord, uh, of the Surrealists, of Baudelaire. Um, that the city is active. It is active. 
Um, I claim that Debord refers to some of the older urbanists. There's a man called Marcel Poet, uh, who wrote extraordinarily important uh, histories of France. By the way, you, if you look in um, the Arcades Project you'll index, you'll find references to him, because Benjamin is using uh, some, of, some of his work. And what um, Poet argued, uh, I think very convincingly, and you find it in things like the architecture of the city, um, is that the city has certain latent forms. And over time, that is to say over extended time, those forms will reassert themselves. And where I think, and Debord picked up on this, I believe Debord picked up on this, and where I think this is relevant in this conversation about agency is I've said, broadly speaking, we are dealing with a new emerging ethico-aesthetic practice, environmental, ecological. And where I think this implication about latent structuring forms that have their own agency is applicable is that it would say, one, concept of nation state has long passed its cell date. That is a redundant way of organizing territory. It's a harmful way of organizing territory. Two, ev even if we can recognize that that is done, we need to look at natural ecologies. When I've traveled in Canada, for example, I became aware that, you know, further west you go, the more that you should think about the relation between America and Canada as north-south, not east-west, right? There are natural ecologies at play. I don't know whom I was listening to recently. Um, I think, yes, it was on the Detroit, the, dis the panel discussion on the Detroit-Berlin connection. And one of the speakers, I can't remember if it was the urbanist from Wayne or someone else, uh, mentioned the Detroit River, the river between um, Windsor and Detroit. Um, and clearly, there are natural ecologies that the various mediations of nation state structures are interfering with. Okay? So if we recognize this agency as implicit in what we call things, as well as processes, it may be that the kind of environmental, ecological aesthetics, ecological practices that are emerging under the umbrella of care and the larger umbrella of biopolitics is essentially saying, this is where we need to go. We need to begin to understand this idea of latent structuring. And the, there are certain natural ecologies. Those are the boundaries, not the boundaries, as it were, that are the result of the mediated structures of the nation state. One last question by somebody who has a burning question to have answered. Okay, I'm going to ask. <laughs> okay. um, I That's was... not fair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> those of you who don't know, I'm the fiance. <laughs> I'll ask it later. No, no, no. <laughs> no. no. Then I really will have to get used to it. Okay, no, I was wondering if uh, it sounds like from what you're saying in terms of entropy and sort of the frozen city, um, what position does this put hope in? Because it seems like, and I'm sort of aligned with you, Rebecca, I can't help but to jump to change. Like, how do we? mobilize ourselves out of this as a whole handful, community. Yeah. But the the intensity, the depth of the intellectual retooling mm -hmm. for an entire region to actually mm -hmm. grasp this concepts first mm -hmm. before any change is possible, where does this leave hope? Maddie, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> the, I, I, I didn't bring my copy of Derrida's Marge, margins, margins of Philosophy. If you Again, most people at this table will know Derrida's lecture come essay on difference, difference. And I've been, in the last two years, I've been studying that with my critical theory study group. I've been reading this essay since I was an undergraduate in graduate school, and I keep coming back to it. And there was a passage that, when I, I was with, I was passing, um, with a small group of students, 
that completely, completely stomped me. Where it's a passage where Derrida talks about l'espérance heideggerienne. L'espérance heideggerienne. Heideggerian hope. And I thought, what could that be? Heideggerian hope. It, I, it, you know, in all of the years of reading it, I must have read over it. I must have been word blind to it. Because when it came up, and this is the point of a study group after all, it's that you don't need to have the answer, I was stumped, but not only stumped, I was deeply, deeply puzzled by it. And we started to do some work on it. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense. Now, I could say, um, the idea of Heideggerian hope has a lot of sense. Because this is the short version. What he means by Heideggerian hope is that because the future is open, it is not predetermined. So that there is a sense in which we can contribute to the making of our future. But being Heidegger, we cannot simply make it. Because what Heidegger is against, of course, which is what he sees as the inheritance of metaphysics, is against voluntarism. Right? All forms of willfulness, that's what he is against. So there is, in place, there is in this work a notion of what hope would be. But of course, we would need to um, distinguish between the things we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, a quotidian basis, to keep going. That's why I've said my work in theological reflection is not pastoral. Right? It's philosophical theology that I would be using. So we would need to distinguish between that day to day and the anthropological level of questioning. So hope here, Heideggerian hope, and that again is another um, talk, but Heideggerian hope here fundamentally means the future is open. If that is so, all is not lost. And that is where, that is where I, I would propose it. It again. seems kind of passive, though. And if, if we're worried about good intentions leading to possible mm. harm, doesn't that, we're, we're kind of frozen. Then, then no, we're just kind of passive. Just I passive. said <laughs> the future is open, meaning that we can contribute to the making of our future, but not in a voluntaristic sense. We can't simply will something. That is what Heidegger is against. But the future is open means that it's not determined. So there is not a determinism here that says, one way or another, you know, you, you know the Auden's poem, uh, we must learn to love one another or die, then he changed it, we must learn to love one another, and then he was asked why? Well, because we're all going to die anyway, right? <laughs> it's not that kind of determinism. That's the point. We have a degree of agency, but as long as we understand agency as non-voluntaristic and set within larger structures, where we need to do more work to understand. Otherwise, we will remain trapped in what in the structures that we already have. That's there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.